first, let me introduce you to the directors and the producer. So to my left, Lisa Molmott, oh, sorry, Molmott has directed and edited award-winning documentaries about this, the American Southwest in recent years, including The Cleaners and Soledad. She has also focused on stories about education. Her award-winning film, Schools Out, has been an integral part of the movement for providing outdoor education for young children, and her short film, Teaching in Arizona, is an inside look at the teaching crisis in that state. A recent Fulbright scholar, she teaches courses at, at the James E. Rogers School of Law at the University of Arizona, where she has worked with the Immigration Law Clinic for the past four years and has also taught in the UA Human Rights Practice graduate program. Um, next to her is um, Jeff Vemis, who is a producer, co-director, and cinematographer. Um, he is an award-winning writer-director who has worked in shorts, features, and documentaries. Jeff's work has aired on network television and PBS. He is a graduate of the University of Southern California Film School and the LA Stanford Meisner Academy. Originally trained in scripted filmmaking, Jeff's film, The Book and the Rose, was a semi-finalist for the Academy Award for Best Short Film. Jeff shot and directed the award-winning short documentary, Coaching Colburn, about a young man with Fragile X Syndrome, which premiered at the prestigious Big Sky Documentary Film Festival. Jeff is a Connecticut Artist Fellow and a Film Independent Fast Track Fellow. He freelances for disability and social activist clients and teaches film at Trinity College in Hartford, Connecticut. And Jacob, who is uh, Bricka, who is producer editor, has edited over a dozen feature documentaries, including the 2016 Sundance Special Jury Prize winner, The Bad Kids, and the international theatrical hit Lost in LA, uh, sorry, Lost in La Mancha. Fluent in Spanish, Jacob also brings experience editing multicultural stories, such as precious knowledge about Arizona's epic battle to ban ethnic studies in public schools, and Beyond the Border, Mas Allá de la Frontera, about four sons from a Mexican family struggling to overcome class barriers in Kentucky. Jacob has produced two feature-length documentaries, is an associate professor at the University of Arizona School of Theater, Film, and Television, and is the author of the definitive volume on documentary editing. Um, so thank you for being here. And um, you know, I know the audience might have some questions about what they just saw on the screen, so I kind of wanted to ask some questions that were more about um, you know, behind the scenes and the process, right, of making a documentary. So, um, you know. I'm particularly curious about the various perspectives that you manage together. And throughout the documentary, these perspectives map out the breakdown in state and federal infrastructure and the varying roles community members in Brooks County take to fill in that gap. So how did you go about establishing these relationships with different members of the community? And how did this relationship, how did these relationships inform your research process or what um, ended up making it on the screen? Is this on? Yeah. I'll say a few things and then I can pass it to Jeff and he can pass it to Jacob since um, well, we probably all have something to say about this. But um, Jeff and I um, began filming this um, in 2015. And I would say like the first year of filming was more research than anything else because it was about going to Brooks County and understanding what was happening and forming relationships with people there. Um, and we, um, I think the fact that the film is told in so many, you know, different from so many different perspectives, one, we, we felt that that was necessary to understand what was happening there, but also, you know, we were just trying to figure out what was happening there and to, you know, for a long time and under, understand it ourselves. So I think in some way that's reflected in the film that we have all of these different perspectives, but we actually couldn't stop filming. I mean, we, we were so shocked when we first got to Brooks County and saw what was happening there. And we were, we, we, the film sort of began as a different story, a short film about something else. Um, and in the, within hours of being in Brooks County, we were like, okay, this is, this, the course of our film has changed and we want to make a film about what is happening here. And just, it was a four year journey of documenting from all of these different perspectives. Um, yeah, we kind of, I mean, we joked that every time we went to, to Brooks County to film, the ending got further and further away and we kept bringing more and more footage back to, to Jacob. And sometimes people ask, um, 
about the vigilante group um, as one group that how did you get involved with with them and um, you know Kate and Eddie were different they were kind of open because they were used to talking to the media but the and the vigilante group were would kind of wanted some press but uh, Michael Vickers would meet us out somewhere and it took us about uh, really about three years of nagging him and begging to kind of go on one of these uh, operations and so that was a process and I think in, I think each group had its own process of building trust but it was something that we kind of had to kind of had to start with zero at zero with and it was just by going back and going back and going back and they would see that we were shooting a lot of footage and that we were working really hard and I think that helped build the trust and anyone said there's nothing we wouldn't shoot so <laughs> if that gives you I mean we had a lot of footage and I think in some ways, some of it was just for our own purposes to get our heads around what was happening, even though sometimes we knew, okay, this is getting off track. Um, it still informed how we understand what's happening and, and talk about now, you know, what's happening in Brooks County. So, um, and, and all of Texas along the border. So yeah, it was a long, long journey. And uh, the footage would end up with me, and I would look at it. Um, and we sort of tried to start finding ways to take these, some, you know, in a way, it's a series of vignettes of different people, and to find a way to, to put them together in a way that you saw the experience of one kind of refracted in the other, in a way. Um, so you just spend a little bit of time with the individual who's, who is found, uh, you know, carrying a water jug, and we learn a little bit about him. But that may be, you know, it, it fills in uh, an unexperience of what that might be like, right? What, what, um, what, what that part of the journey might be like for somebody who, you know, fortunately is found. Um, and so, you know, we had, by the time we, we came to further in the editing, we had two main stories and a, a lot of these other little vignettes. And we just kept working until we could figure out how to how to uh, piece them all together. Um, and obviously it's Omero's story who kind of anchors it and his brother and sister-in-law and family kind of became partners with us uh, as we as we filmed and then also as we've, we've taken the film out, they've been with, with us uh, to many, many, many screenings talking about it. So one of the fascinating aspects about your documentary is, is the context. You know, as you mentioned, you started this project in two, um, 2015 and it first screened in 2020. Um, I think that it's true in many ways, not, mu not much has changed, but I also think the opposite tr is true. A lot has changed. And, you know, between Trump's 2015 promise to build the wall and the drastic changes to immigration processes um, caused by the COVID-19 emergency, um, things did change. So how did the context and impact of the documentary change between 2015 and 2020 as you know you went through this process? Again, I'll start and just keep passing it. Um, so after Donald Trump was elected, um, I think the first thing we noticed in Brooks County was there was more law enforcement, more board patrol in Falfurious and around the checkpoint, and that has all remained. Um, so that was like the most obvious thing that changed. Um, and um, I think, you know, it, it was interesting because in the process of making the film, you know, I mean, five, four or five years is a long time to um, make a documentary. And I was like, you know, we got to get this film out there so it's still relevant. Like, the, you know, at a certain point, like things become irrelevant. But, but, and and there's no way we could have predicted um, that the situation now, given um, that 2022 was the worst year on record for migrant deaths along the U.S.-Mexico co co border. It is was um, by the United Nations IO, IOM, um, International Organization on Migration. Um, they um, just came out very recently stating that the U.S.-Mexico border is the deadliest border crossing, um, land border crossing in the world. Um, and last year was the worst year on record. And I think starting in 2015, I never would have thought things would actually get worse. Um, and now with climate change, um, 
and and you know one of the reasons one of the things we don't state in the film about this situation is the reason why people come in the hotter months um late spring and summer and early fall um, in south texas is because all of these ranches are private and the um what's happening on the ranches um is hunting so migrants don't want to come during hunting season which is the winter um, which would be much more sane um but so they come when they can and it's during the hottest months and so every august you know we predict there's going to be media saying you know all about t talking about all of these migrant deaths and you get a couple of articles every august late august and then it just goes away for a year and then in august again you see another new york times article washington post and then it goes away and we've watched this for now how many nine years <laughs> basically the same thing and, and and nothing has changed except that it's gotten worse in terms of the number of um remains that are found each year i, I don't really have a lot to add to that except that um the people that we've sometimes partnered with in the outreach and impact for this film, like the Washington Office in Latin America and other groups and NGOs, they're not very happy with the Biden administration either um, because really, as Lisa said, the net effect is the same, really. There's not much change. You know, the Title 42 ended, but there's a transit ban, and these things haven't really, nothing's really moved forward in a, in a positive direction. Uh, significantly, I think is fair to say. Well, the Missing Persons Act. Yeah, the one thing is, um, it's interesting because with immigration, you know, you, you, you see the headlines and there's a lot of um, partisan sniping, but then you look back at what's been passed and it really challenges your notion of traditional left and right politics, this, this issue of immigration. Um, you know, Reagan gave amnesty and Bill Clinton, as you know from the film now, is really his administration more responsible for these deaths than any other. And yet, the only president to ever sign a bill that took any responsibility on behalf of the federal government for these deaths was Donald Trump, which he did with the Missing Persons and Unidentified Remains Act, which he signed um, at the end of December, at the end of his term. Uh, so, uh, but you know, really the problem, the death, the death rate continues to climb, and it, that's always been a constant, sadly. So before I turn it to the audience, I have one last question. So by this point, you've been able to screen the documentary and talk about it across different media, across different um, audiences, PBS, podcasts, academics, Border Patrol agents. Um, has the documentary's reception by any of your audiences surprised you? Do you want to talk about the Texas tour? Yeah, we um, we've done a lot of impact, um, a lot of many impact screenings with the film. Um, but one that sticks out in my mind is um, Jeff and I during um, the height of the pandemic decided it was a good idea to do a tour of Texas with this film. We did a bunch of mostly outdoor screenings, like we had a screen and a projector, and we went around Texas. Um, and one of those screenings was in San Antonio, and um, the there were uh, some conservative people in the audience who, well, I know that from just um, the the questions they were asking, and prior to the screening, and um, during the Q and A, uh, this woman stood up and said, you know. Um, this film really has made me think a lot about some of my views on immigration. And um, thank you so much for telling, you know, bringing this story to my attention. And this, uh, you know, is gonna, you know, give me some something to chew on. Um, and, you know, we, um, we've been on conservative talk uh, radio with this, about this film, we've, um, we have, made a couple of trips to DC. We did a, a Senate hearing and a congressional hearing. We've, um, you know, we went to Cuba with the film. We talked to people who, young people who are thinking about immigrating to the US um, and Cuba. Um, and it's all memorable because this film, it's just, 
it's so interesting showing different audiences the film and knowing that you know we're all human it's it's um this is not about politics this is about human beings and everyone gets that and it doesn't matter whether i agree with their politics or not or grew up in the same way that they did or not it, it we're all kind of experiencing this in the same way which is just shock and anger and you know people ask what can i do um so okay Thank you so much for that. Um, I'm now going to turn it to the audience. Um, we will have um, someone walking around with a microphone. So, you know, you can just go ahead and raise your hand and a microphone will be passed to you. Hi, um, thank you very much for this really powerful film. I'm, it's hard to even like ask a question. <laughs> I'm still processing so much about it. Um, this is sort of out of left field, but something um, I've been thinking about a lot in the context of my own work um, with, with, with migrant people in the Mediterranean context. And I'm wondering about the first, the opening scenes of the human remains made me think about these conversations that are opening up again regarding indigenous remains that are housed in universities. And I was just thinking about this sort of visual archive of material that you have and also, um, you know, both in the film and then in excess of that and how you might be thinking about that in relationship to questions about remains, about repatriation, about... Um, um, I don't know, accessibility of material, like materials for people in the future who might be looking through that, that sort of material as well. If that's something that, that you've thought about or it's come up at all for you. Leslie, you're giving me more work. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> um, I don't know. I mean, I do, I do think that Kate's Bradley's group, uh, Operation Identification, I do think that they they collect materials as they go along. I don't think we've ever gotten that question. It's an excellent question. Mm -hmm. I I think that there I could envision a, a time when um, Op ID comes to us and says, you know, we're starting a new project and we, we're wondering if you want to, you know, donate your footage, which of course we'd you know be happy to do. I'm sure. Mm -hmm. But yeah, I, had, I yeah. hadn't really thought about no. it. Thank you. It's a really moving film, and uh, thank you for making it. Uh, I had a question about the water, the, the barrels of water, and where they were in relationship to where people were, where people went missing versus people who succeeded in getting through. When they took the, what was it, 14, 15 barrels out, they disappeared. Um, I was wondering if that was also from the vigilante group uh, on their land, because I wasn't sure which, you, you put the Mariposa Ranch and I didn't know whose ranch that was. So I'm just wondering about where water didn't exist, for instance, on that one uh, uh, rancher who said, well, I have the, the uh, water source for his cattle. Did the water barrels help reduce the, the number of deaths in that area? Uh, so Eddie Canales, uh, who is the, you know, spearheads that project, although as you can see, uh, the other rancher who you spend a tiny bit of time with, who claims credit for the, being the fur, the Vosier Durham, he he also does this on the ranch that he operates. Um, uh, but Eddie Canales uh, figures that they are useful because he does you know replenish the water and some you know he will they every so often they go out and 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 you know check them, and there are times when they 
when the water's been taken um, and they will then replace it. So uh, I, you guys can help me on this. I think it is really hard for him to be able to document X number of lives saved because how do you prove a negative? <laughs> well, um, yeah. What about the reverse of that? Where the bodies, where more of the bodies have been found, is that where there are no rain barrels because a, a, a rancher won't allow it? The, the roots are, you guys should correct me on this, but um, as you can see from that map that shows up before they're doing that search, there are a lot of ranches. Some of them are absolutely enormous. The Cage Ranch is one of them. Uh, and then there are other ones that are relatively small and it is kind of a patchwork of the ones that are uh, where where Eddie is allowed, where they say, sure, come and, come and do your work and, and put your barrels on the ones that he does not have permission. And I don't know if, if so it's sort of like the patchwork is, is a little too inconsistent to be able to draw immediate conclusions like the one that you're asking for. Um, but I think Eddie would probably say he, he'll do it regardless of whether, uh, you know, exactly what, what statistics are, are shown uh, or whatever. And the fact that there, the water is being used clearly on, on at least some occasions is proof enough to him that that's true. And it is true that, that you know, the, the inference that, that um, Mike Vickers draws from this is, look, they're on the, on the, they're on the major routes and therefore he must be in cahoots with them. <laughs> uh, they are on some of the major routes. Uh, so I, I think it's fair to say that they are having an effect. Exactly exactly what that is is kind of hard to, to determine. And, and Eddie does use the death mapping data to choose where to put the water stations, if a rancher will agree. So, and, and of course there's snake bite and heat stroke and sometimes when you reach that level of dehydration, you know, the water may not help at that point. So, or they may not find the barrels or so and forth. And surprisingly, so in the, hard. and surprisingly in the winter, I mean, there are fewer migrants crossing, as Lisa said, for, for that reason. And we did do a whole shoot with people who are out there hunting, <laughs> uh, which didn't make it into the film. But uh, there are some, some de deaths are from exposure in the winter. Uh, you know, it gets, it, it's rainy and it gets really cold out there. And can I say one more thing? Um, before the next question, um, because I really don't want to leave here without saying this. Um, but regarding your um, comment about seeing the Mariposa Ranch sign, um, I think that might be the only ranch sign we put in the film. And it just reminds me to say that the, um, the Yale Docu Project, which is a um, media law clinic, took this project on pro bono as um, an assignment in a course. Um, and they went through the film scene by scene and gave us legal advice or sort of gave us um, advice about anything that seemed questionable or could be potentially uh, problematic uh, legally. And um, one of the things after this three hour consultation, very detailed consultation, very scary consultation, um, that we did was we took out the ranch names for almost all the ranches. I think we had a bunch of other signs in there and we took them all out except for the Mariposa because we felt that was part of the story. Like that was necessary um, because we kept going back to that same ranch and, and people were, were referring to the ranch. So we left it in. We did get permission also on that ranch um, to film. I think we felt more solid on that particular ranch. The other ranches, um, we got permission from the managers, but we learned that that's not enough. It's actually the owner that needs to give you. So in case you're ever thinking of doing this, there's a <laughs> bunch of documentary students out there. Um, so I just wanted to like give a shout out to that clinic because that was a real education that, uh, you know, and it was all pro bono and just amazing. Yeah, we owe them a huge debt. They were really wonderful. And then the, the other part of your question real quick is those, those barrels that were taken, they were outside the ranch gates. So those were on a public road. I mean, it was out in the middle of nowhere, but anybody could have just driven up and grabbed those. And Eddie has his suspicions, which I will not repeat, but we don't know. We don't know where, but it's not easy to take them. I mean, they got to take those, mm -hmm. The, they took the poles out of the ground, and I mean, it would be very difficult to take 15 of those one them. person. There's a question in the back. Thanks. Thanks for the um, opportunity to talk to you about this this film. Um, um, I have two two 
parts to my question. They're kind of different. So I just, in the interest of time, I'll just put them both out there. And then if, if you'd like to um, respond to either one of them. Um, one of them is about the, the making of documentary. So my class at Wesleyan had the, the opportunity yesterday to hear from Jacob about um, the making of documentary and narrative and narrativity. I wondered, um, you know, on one level, I wondered if in the working on this film, if it affected or how it affected your thinking about um, documentary as a media, you know, in terms of um, just any thoughts about that uh, in terms of the edits you're making and, and the choices. The other question is about the subject matter. So I um, direct a center for the study of guns and society at Wesleyan. And, um, you know, I was really struck by the scenes around hunting, and I think this kind of way that hunting and surveillance are also getting closer together. In fact, I think there was a court case about five years ago where a, a ranch had to shut down um, because of a injunction because they were using, um, what they were doing was um, encouraging kind of safari hunting, uh, hunting of, wild, of animals on the ranch property as a way to make money, but people could hunt from their computers in New Jersey. And so the technology of doing surveillance at night for the purpose of hunting, and when you said that in the winter, the, the migrants aren't crossing because of the fear of hunting, just also those scenes of the animals. I, what, I guess my question was if I mean, a lot, you know, given how few of the missing people have been recovered, and mostly when they are, the finding is of dehydration. But listening to the, um, you know, some of the armed vigilantes and just tracking that a little bit myself, I was curious if you or any of the people you talked with there thought that there also is lynching happening. Do one of you want to take the first question, and I'll, I mean, the second question, then I'll take the first. Well, there was there was a case of lynching, but I can't remember the details. Do you remember the details of that? Um, but I, yeah, I, I, yeah, I can't remember. But um, I, they, it, the vigilantes, did run into some problems bef it, before we were filming with them for detaining people, which they're not legally allowed to do. Um, so the, there's some question about whether there was the camera effect with us around. And maybe they cleaned up their act a little bit. I was a little surprised how, who those people were. I mean, I thought it would sort of be any cowboy with a gun, you know. Who, and but they were uh, NASA engineers. They were retired judges, politicians, and they would people would come and spend their vacations sometimes doing this um, tracking migrants on these ranches. There was this there was this weird sporting element to it, and. Uh, you know, they were ostensibly trying to stop traffic from coming through. But if nothing happened that night, they were so disappointed. And that was just, again, this this sort of, this distasteful sporting um, vibe to the whole thing. And I mean, they were also proud of, of the lives that they said they had saved, uh, in some cases. Because, you know, as, as you can see, if it, at that point you do want to be found by somebody presuming that they will end up <laughs> returning you to shelter and water and such. Um, but yeah, it was, it was a definitely a weird vibe. Um, and your first question was sort of about making, putting together documentary, the documentary and, um, you know, this is, again, this film is sort of a, it's an amalgam experience. Uh, we, we stayed pretty close to the, within each of the two stories, we, we were very faithful to, I mean, of course you have to take creative license with, with precisely when you tell what, but we were very faithful to the facts as they occurred. Um, you know, so you, you, you are there the moment when Juan Jr. was found, uh, just like it's shown, et cetera. But then there are all the other little vignettes that, that play around in, in there. And so for instance, the vigilantes are out there at night, they think they see someone, the scene ends, and then there's just a, an interstitial moment where you just see brush at night, and then you're in, in the car, with the sheriff's deputy who finds someone on the road. 
And there was, we had advice from someone like, just put those scenes right together. They make the call and here's the guy and he comes out, even though they were different evenings. And we had it that way for a little bit. And then we decided, well, that is pretty misleading, <laughs> um, that it didn't occur that way that night, right? And that it doesn't necessarily make that much difference in the story. So that was the reason why that, that shot is in the middle there, uh, which is just a shot of things at night and then we cut to a new scene. And so it's kind of ambiguous, or I don't know, you can tell me how you interpreted it, but we invite the interpretation of, look, they were out looking for someone, here's who, here's who they found, and yet we're not directly saying that that is is what happened but on an amalgam level that that is what we're saying happens because they are alleging that these are terrorists and they're they're coming to town to to overthrow the government from the inside and our experience from being there our meaning their <laughs> experience they're the ones who shot over over this amount of time was that it's much more if you had to put it into one story this this you know Miguel Angel who was who you know with the wet socks that is a pretty typical event right that is the kind of person who is found out there so it's it's sort of choices like that and then other choices where we were really we wanted to make you feel like you had been out there so there are moments in which we that are scenes that are relatively leisurely where where you just sort of sit and you listen to the sounds um, and that was really important to us to feel like um, you could feel like like it might have felt out there and they would come back talking about the sounds of the brush um, and that's why we ended and we also like for instance at the end we always assumed there'd be an ending song we had but money in the budget to to license something we tried out i don't know how many different songs and it never it nothing ever felt appropriate and it, and there's a lot of music in the film um i hope it's relatively subtle and such but when we went to the credits it always felt wrong and so we were like why do we need music it's more much more appropriate to just be out there in the brush with those sounds and just let them play it felt more respectful it felt more appropriate um you know it wasn't you didn't get like sort of a an uplift moment but <laughs> Um, well, also, it forces you, the viewer, to continue thinking about what you just saw rather than have some kind of music be in your head and you've moved on. I think that's usually with credit credit music. you it's, it's sort of to kind of jolt you out of the experience of watching a film. And we did not want that. We want people to <clears throat> reflect on what they just saw and have all of the emotions that one might have after seeing something like this. So, And we hope that there, I mean, we feel like there is hope in the film. There's quite a bit of hope with the fact that people are out there caring as much as they do and, and, you know, spending in, uh, I don't know, there's, uh, we hope it's not as bleak as, as some moments might make it, make it feel, but, um, the, but it also, you know, like to, yeah, it's, it's a, I mean, it's a film about death. So, <laughs> yeah. Um, so I, I have a question that came from um, a viewer on Zoom, and this is a follow-up to the audience question. So they want to know who was your intended audience and, you know, did you hope to reach or challenge cons uh, conservative audiences or points of view with your documentary? Um, I'll start and... Yeah, I mean, so we um, decided to um, get, well, we decided we were very lucky to get funding from PBS um, toward the end of the process. And that means getting funding from PBS means the film will broadcast on PBS, not HBO, not, you know. And one of the um, great things about PBS is the audience is half liberal, half conservative. And that just felt like the right thing for this film. Um, so in terms of target audience, anyone that will watch, anyone that will watch and listen, you know, I'll talk to anyone about this film. And, you know, so um, usually, like I always tell my students, like you need to have a target audience. like. <laughs> And I don't know necessarily, I mean, we're just as happy to share about this film with um, a church group as we are, you know, we showed the film to Border Patrol leaders. Um, they weren't necessarily our intended, I wasn't thinking about Border Patrol leaders when we made this film, but certainly like in the back of our minds, like, of course we want to show it to Border Patrol leaders. So I, you know. Did we have a target audience? Job? I mean, we did. We did talk about making a 360 degree portrait of what was happening in Brooks County. We wanted to treat the audience like intelligent, capable of making up their own minds about what kind of policies 
should administer the border. But in order to do that, you have to know what's going on. You have to witness. And so I think sometimes we were thinking, we just want people to see this. And I think we also felt that if um, if people could meet the families of the missing, they would feel differently about the way we're administering our border. Certainly lawmakers would feel differently about the policies that they're um, enacting. You have a question back there? Yeah, I have a question. It was an amazing film, you guys. Thank you so much for bringing it here. Um, I'm from Arizona, so it's very dear to my heart. Y'all are my professors, so you know. <laughs> um, just seeing this, I, I've spent a lot of time in Douglas, and so I'm very familiar with the border situation in Arizona. Um, and one of the things that I really appreciated you guys doing was bringing all aspects of how people become missing, whether that's you know death or dehydration or the unknown. And so I was just wondering if you guys had any stories. I know that you guys probably had a lot of different stories and you had to be very selective of which ones you included in the film. But were there any stories of people who were missing and, and were found or, you know, just in a different state, um, anything like that? And, and I just really wanted to also point out, um, Bertha, you already did, that, that the ending was silent and just the sounds of the, of the nature. I really appreciated that. Um, it was almost like a moment of respect for the people who are still missing or lost. And so I just, before you mentioned it, I wanted to bring up that it was, it was a very beautiful moment and I really appreciated that. Oh, so my question was if you guys had any people that- Were uh, found. Yeah. Were found, yeah. <laughs> I mean, well, there were a lot, we shot a lot of footage, so there were a lot of stories, you're right. And there are, uh, you know, as the, the title card says, there have been quite a few cases in which Caitlyn Bradley's group have been successful. There, yeah, they're up to 100. So they passed 100. So. And, you know, one sort of interesting thing is that actually the way that, that, um, that this sort of process works of recovery and uh, and the coordination between agencies and such is actually much, much, much more functional in Arizona than it is in Texas. So their rate is much, much, much higher. Uh, the kind of percentage of if you were to go missing in Arizona uh, and and die, whether whether you would your identity would be found and, and you know your remains would be reunited is is just. Um, it's just a different system. Texas is highly decentralized. A lot of these counties don't have much of a budget or much expertise, are not actually following the law. There's no coordination. There's confusion about responsibility. And as you hear in that story, even sometimes the funeral homes are kind of, you know, sure, we'll take your money and then we'll just <laughs> pocket the money. And, you know, uh, so there's, it's a, um, and Brooks County is now one of the better places that in terms of the way it's run, but that's partly because of sort of, you know, expose on previous practices. So, and, and the, so in Arizona, we've got a medical examiner. I, I live in Tucson, medical examiner and an NGO called the Calibre Center for Human Rights. And they are in the same building and they meet weekly and they compare the remains, um, the DNA from the remains, and then the phone calls from the families, you know, DNA from the family members, and they can put these two things together and make matches, and they do, and it's very successful. And as Jacob mentioned, in Texas, that doesn't exist. Um, it's the Wild West in Texas. There's no centralized system. And one of the reasons why we've been to D.C. with the film was to get NGOs like, you know, what's happening at Texas State um, funding to do what they're doing. They're, you know, they're not funded by the federal government. They're, they're writing grants. They're doing this work as part of research at a university. So that has been um, a goal. One goal of this film is to uh, help them, support them in this centralized system um, for Texas. And in fact, um, there were two more stories we filmed that didn't make it into the film. One of them, the fam and both were identifications that were done by Operation Identification, Op ID. And uh, one of them, the family decided um, in the middle that they just weren't ready, which is understandable. It's not. This is not for everyone. Um, and the other story, I think we just couldn't find. A, a place for it in the film. It was just, it was a really complicated film with a lot of stories. 
And, and it, it was, was a complicated story. It was, it was, it was, it was compelling. It was mm-hmm. a very compelling story. A sister had, um, a sister had died and then her living sister, uh, who was also undocumented, uh, was kind of stuck uh, between what they kind of call two borders, you know, the interior checkpoint and then the U.S.-Mexico border. It's an area that sometimes is referred to as the golden cage. And she actually, could, it was really sad, she actually could not go to her sister's funeral because it was held north of the checkpoint um, where, you know, it, where she had known people and had there was family and she was, couldn't, she was afraid to cross the checkpoint that had, you know, resulted in her sister's demise. Of course, so um, it was um, it was just too complicated to put in the in the. And film. in addition to that, she was in a domestic violence situation where she couldn't leave this situation because she was stuck between these two borders and didn't have family around. And eventually, I believe she the authorities let her go to Houston because of this domestic violence. But for years, she was living in this situation. We met her. We, we talked with her. We filmed with her. Um, and, and so it's like not, you know, like this issue of these interior checkpoints, they have so many consequences. Um, even beyond death, they create these situations where people can't get medical assistance. People can't get out of an abusive relationship. People, you know, can't go to a funeral. It's like... Um, those are just a few things, but. And there is one question back here. Um, thank you so much for this film. This was like um, very hard hitting and, and like beautiful um, to see. Uh, I have two questions. One, as you mentioned, like you went there and you discovered for yourself as well. So like curious if you could share a little bit about how it evolved uh, over time. And as you mentioned, you could take in some stories but could not do the others. Um, and the second is how like you, it's, it's amazing how you build those relations and that trust with people right from the authorities to the vigilante groups to even more importantly, the families who like went through a lot of like turmoil and it was not like a story for them. So curious about how you kind of um, dealt with that. And also you must have like shot so much like in the car and everywhere. Like, was there something as a filmmaker that you were thinking about managing? Like, how did you manage filming, uh, like going out to the field or the desert when they were like identifying the missing people or like even the different stories like I'm just curious about how that process was for you I'll say about the about working with the families just one uh, anecdote and then they can talk about what it was like filming the uh, Omar and Michelle who are the uh, the married couple and it's his brother and her brother-in-law who is missing uh, they found us so we had a website before the film was done called missingbrookscounty.com and right around the point at which, of course, it had been two years, all of this had happened, and yet they were sort of back to thinking, no, we don't want to give up. Um, Michelle Googled missing Brooks County, Texas, and she came up with our film. And she just wrote us on the little contact form, and we immediately put her in touch with Eddie Canales. But we they were also about to make a trip to Texas, and they said, would you be interested in meeting with us? And they were they really were quite ready. They they were very much wanted uh, their story told. And that was how that came about. It was a weird, uh, that's not, we weren't soliciting people or anything, but that that's how that story actually, uh, that's how our involvement with them uh, started. And for the documentary filmmaking students out there, um, I see you all. Um, I have to be honest, um, when we got that email from Michelle, I was like, not another family. Like, we're already filming with two families. And, you know, this film is getting out of control. We've got the vigilantes. We've got the, you know. and <clears throat> But, you know, you know deep inside you have to explore every possibility, even though I was overwhelmed by the directions that we were going, all the different directions we were going in. And so... We, you know, we wrote back and said, you know, we're coming to Texas next week. Like, can we meet? 
And we did. And it was amazing because I think very, very quickly we met in Starbucks. Um, we knew very quickly that this was going to be a good match. Um, I think in part because it had been two years. It wasn't as raw as some of the other families. But also, you know, we were careful. We were like, look, go back as a family. Talk to your parents. Talk through this. See if this feels like a good thing for your family. And like, I don't know, within hours, we heard back that they were very much wanting to participate. Um, And then we just began filming probably the next day. Um, but, um, but my instinct at first was like, oh no, you know, it's like, this is so complicated, like too many families, too many, I mean, we've, but to, you know, to answer your question, question, first question, like, we, you know, we did, we have footage of other crossers that we, you know, met that were, that had given up, you know, and from Honduras and, you know, all over it just, we have a lot of footage that we never put into the film. Um, and so, but, you know, just a word, you know, just a lesson learned, you know, for myself as well, is that, you you know, you need to pursue all different um, leads and see where they go, as difficult as it seems, because um, it can be very overwhelming having hundreds of hours of footage and knowing, you know, I'm come from an editing background, knowing that someone has to like sift through all this footage and make sense of it all. And uh, so, you know, at a certain point you have to discriminate. Yeah, but it was just, it was Jacob. So I was like, okay, let's do it. <laughs> <laughs> and I mean, there are some some types of documentary films that you really can research and prosecute in a way that allows you to be pretty targeted about, you know, you can search out, you know, experts and to do interviews and, and uh, lead people through things in a way where your research will lead you to what you want to shoot. And, and it's kind of straightforward. And then there is sort of the cinema verite ideal, which is you learn as you go (laughs) and you shoot a lot of stuff and you kind of make sense of it as you look at what you've gathered in a way, it's a much more sort of, uh, far flung and organic kind of uh, searching that you're doing and that you're living inside of. And that was what more interesting to all of us, even though it's, it's, uh, it's, uh, it, 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 it's, it's harder to know that, that you're going in the right direction or that, uh, you know, exactly what you're doing at any given moment. It, it starts to become clearer as you start to form conclusions about what it is that you've shot and, and in retrospect, like, okay, yeah, it's a mosaic. There, there are vignettes, you know, it, it sounds easy to talk about, but as you're making it, it can be, um, you are sort of struggling to figure out how the meaning that you're finding in it can be uh, put together in a way that, that will uh, express that kind of meaning. Uh, so. So I think we're reaching time. I just want to say thank you so much for this conversation and any last remarks or anything that you want to leave us with? I'd like to thank everyone who's responsible for bringing us here uh, a lot. It's Teresa. Been... <laughs> okay, thank, thank you. you so much. Thank you. Charlie and thank, thank Charlie Musser. Thank you for those of, uh, those of you who've joined us online right now. Uh, we know there are yeah. those folks out there. 